Okay, hey everybody. I'm uh, Lucas Mandrake, and I'm a group supervisor of the Machine Learning and Instrument Autonomy Group at JPL. I'll be giving you a very different kind of lecture today. Instead of going through the mathematics of how machine learning algorithms work, I'll be talking to you about some of their applications that are going on right now and giving you some actual concrete advice on workflows that matter um, and things we've learned, lessons learned on what works, what doesn't, and why, especially with pertaining to how to advance physical science working with scientists. But before we actually start on that material, um, there'll be some announcements about your homework and stuff that Jake Lee will provide you. But while we're waiting for everyone to filter in, I wanted to give kind of a, an early opportunity for Q&A. And if there aren't any questions, then I want to learn a little bit more about you and your preparation and your interests. So first, I'll just open it up. Are there any initial questions that people wanted to talk about? JPL, science advancement, what we do, anything like that? Uh, the microphone doesn't appear to be working, unfortunately. So if you can't hear me in the back, tell me, and I will. I, d I am capable of projecting that far, but you may need to occasionally remind me. Um, can you hear me now if I do this? OK, good. I, people usually don't tell me I'm too quiet, so it should be OK. Um, any other questions or thoughts before we go? Well, then tell me a little bit about yourself for your background and your preparation. How many people here feel like they are comfortable with statistics, they are comfortable that if you were asked to do a hypothesis test, you kind of know what that is. Uh, if someone gave you data and said, is this actually supporting the hypothesis you claimed, you have an idea what to do. A show of hands on who feels confident enough to do that. And by the way, that also is a cutting edge problem that if you really know what you're doing, you probably put your hand down, because that is a very hard thing to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, people get more confident and then less confident, depending on what you know. Uh, how about have people, you've learned a few simple machine learning methods in here right now. How many people besides the homework for this course have actually downloaded some libraries and just played with them and seen what they can do and not do, that sort of thing, and, and got a feel for that? And tell me a little bit about your reactions when you saw that. What, what, were you, what, what did you learn about what they were doing well and what did you learn about you were kind of shocked at how badly they were doing? What did you see? I wouldn't say I was shocked one way or the other about like the performance, but just like how much of a small part of like putting the of, like building the model is actually like, the hard part of like, you know, good data wrangling and all those lines as opposed to you know train test split throw it in the existing library. That's a great observation, right? The the, the learning the of the machine learning takes almost no time at all, yeah. and all the decisions up front of your test train splits and your annotation strategy and all that define the problem that it's going to learn and it's going to do for you. And it is almost impossible to do it right the first time. So you have to spend almost all your time iterating on that because you can't do it right the first time. That's a great observation. What else have you seen? Any observations? My observation is the opposite. I, the packages I downloaded usually take much longer than I expected. Mm. Like they, they would take um, like hours sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't very really happy with that. I, I was hoping to get something that would work faster. So I was kind of disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I would actually say, if you're not disappointed the first time you try to use machine learning, you probably didn't try to do something hard enough. Because it isn't straightforward. It isn't import a library, run it, and then you're like, wow, that was amazing. It actually is a tool that requires quite a lot of skill to set up and learn properly. And depending on which model you try, you'll say, oh, that learned extremely quickly and took no time at all, but I don't like the results. Or it took so long to run, I'm not sure if I really care anymore at the end. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But there's two other chances that I have to talk with you where we'll really get into that, simple models versus complex models, and about how there's a sweet spot. And if you use a model that's too big and too complicated, you actually now take too long to train and, and test, and therefore you probably can't do good rigorous validation, so why are you bothering even to do it at all? So that is a real challenge as well. And industry loves that problem. That's the problem they want to solve, is that it takes too long to run, but not necessarily what science wants you to solve. And we'll get to that. Data access is perennially, perennially a core problem of like, I try to download ImageNet and it takes like a week <laughs> to download ImageNet. Um, or any of those like open source data sets that you want to try 
a lot of times it takes forever just to download it on your computer before you can try anything. So um, there's different industry solutions that they're trying to do, but you know, uh, it's, it, a, a lot of times you'll hear bring the code to the data instead of bring the data to your code or other buzzwords like that. But this is a constantly evolving uh, space where uh, people are trying to come up with different solutions and uh, we're trying to solve that. We have time for a few more questions, or you want to go? Uh, if you want to take more questions, you can. All right. There's one thing I just wanted to bounce off you. It's not formally part of this lecture, but when's the last time in the news you heard, scientist does something amazing with a decision tree and learns something new? This happens all the time. You've never seen it in the news, not once. But how many times have you heard, enormous new network that takes hours to run and requires specialized hardware figures out how to do something slightly better than it did before. This is everywhere, right? And ChatGPT is the latest example of this, right? It is so big that it requires millions of dollars of electricity every time they want to retrain it. And the fact that you have to log in and use it is not just because they want to use it for themselves, but because you don't have the hardware to run this thing. Be careful. There are companies out there who make a living by selling you hardware. That hardware can be used to run large models. In order to increase that business model, they pay people to use and make models that require that hardware and publish lots of papers and then get lots of publicity about how amazing this is. There's funding going on at levels that science normally doesn't have access to. And all of that funding goes to say, you need my latest big model. And here it is for free. You can download it and it's cool. You can use it, but it requires hardware that happens to be rather expensive, and by the way, we sell that. So there's an enormous conflict of interest in who's dominating what you see in the news about machine learning. Small is beautiful, small is more understandable. You should use the simplest, smallest model that solves your problem. The latest model is not necessarily the right fit. So just be careful. You're working in a hype field right now. I think uh, ChatGPT, they said, it takes a million dollars a day to keep running at its current rate. Yeah. And it is a fascinating yeah. object. Just don't think you need that to get work done. Yeah, I have a question. So we're, we're training all the models on our computers. Like, it's, it's kind of a structure. So you said it's required specialized hardware. Like, is there like a customer design circuit that kind of run a different way than the CPU or the CPU? So when I say specialized hardware, I usually mean GPUs. But companies like Google and things that run giant models routinely have actually made like tensor processing units that just have a slightly different arrangement of how much they, speci they specialize in the cache arrangements and things like that to really advance the linear algebra as fast as possible for things like deep neural nets. So you can do some specialization, but it's, it's nothing more than that. You will hear really radical hardware like neuromorphic circuits and things like that that are supposed to accelerate it enormously. Graph, graph stuff. But that's, yeah. that's bleeding edge, limited, and they're still wandering around saying, does anybody need this? So we don't even know if that's a good way to go or not. All right, brief uh, interruption just to cover some course logistics stuff. Uh, homework two is due tomorrow at 9 p.m. As you already probably know, uh, again, if you have issues, there is a office hour today at 6, um, held by Max. Max is doing awesome on Piazza right now, answering programming questions. So if you have issues with your IPython notebooks, they're not running. If you're getting overflow, there is something wrong. You know, There's some math somewhere that's not working. You should not be getting uh, numerical overflows in your uh, code. So if you have issues, um, go to that office hours. We also have a recitation today at 7. Um, that one's in the loca locations on Piazza. Um, hold on, let me, let me pull up those locations right now. So the office hours uh, today at 6 um, is in Annenberg Conference Room. And then we will, I will post the recitation location shortly. I think we have, to uh, we have to confirm the reservation for that. But that one is on linear algebra. So if you're kind of shaky on your lineage, if you're confused by matrix multiplication and dot multiplication, and then later on, we're going to go on to like gradients of matrix operations, and that gets real fun. So if you're kind of shaky on your linear algebra, uh, I suggest you attend. Slides will also be posted online if you're not able to attend, um, but that's a good one to go to. Uh, what else? And then homework three will be released subsequently sometime early Friday. We try to do it before noon, but sometimes you know we have to make changes and things like that. So uh, we'll, again, post another Piazza post when that happens. 
By the way, if you're not using Piazza and if you're not checking it daily, you are missing out. There's a, we answer a lot of questions. I think we give away like half the homework, honestly, um, on just answering questions on Piazza. Take full use of it. Um, if you have issues with your code, we are getting private questions where people post a link to the collab and say, help me debug this uh, notebook. We're happy to do that. Uh, we're here to help you learn. We're not here to like give you a bad grade, right? So check Piazza. We post errata. We post uh, F like, PSAs, for example, numpy dot dot for dot products does not do what you think it does if you give it two-dimensional arrays. So there's a lot of these things that show up on Piazza. So check it every day, keep up to date, um, make sure you're not missing out on a resource that other students are taking full advantage of. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know if uh, Dr. Reva, uh, Reva Pragada mentioned the ombudsperson volunteering. Um, so an uh, ombudsperson will kind of interface with us lecturers to give feedback on the course. If there's issues that we're not addressing, then an ombuds person can um, kind of advocate on your behalf. So if you want to volunteer to be that person, please email uh, the head TA, uh, Emil, and we'll get that set up. And you can kind of advocate for your uh, fellow students, and you get to put another line on your resume uh, about that. So if that's something that you're kind of interested in, uh, please go ahead and do that. And that's about it. By the way, if you're submitting a homework and you run into a technical issue or a personal issue or some extenuating circumstances, just email us. I, we're not strict about the late hour stuff. The 48 hours is just there to kind of give you a bit of flexibility on the submission. But if you like submitted your PDF and your collab link doesn't work or something, like just email us. We'll give you an hour for free. Right? Don't worry about that. Don't stress about uh, the deadlines and things like that. OK? All right, that's all from me. Back to Dr. Mandrake for the lecture itself. All right, thank you. So what we're going to be talking about today is how to use machine learning to help physical scientists get done what they need to get done using today's data sets. And one of the things I want to really leave you with immediately is that the machine learning you've already learned, as simple as it is and as early as it is in the field, can immediately make benefits for physical scientists right now using their field. You do not need the latest and most expressive models to make a really big difference. It's much more about the approach that you use and the questions that you ask that you're helping them with. You will sometimes want those big models and expressive models when your problem is suited for it, and they are powerful and exciting. But the simple stuff actually is more powerful when it's appropriate. And so keep in mind, every example I'm going to give you right now could technically be advanced by the machine learning you already know. So the outline of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to describe what the physical science endeavor really is. What's it about and how does technology help it go forward? I'm going to compare what's going on in industry. And the reason I'm comparing that is because they're the ones who are generating almost all the libraries you're using and advancing this field very aggressively with a lot of funding and availability. But how that's different than science applications and the focuses can be different. I'm going to talk about the difference between big data, which you hear about in the news all the time, and big complexity which is what I call when you're trying to look at data that has extremely sophisticated contents, multiple data sets overlapping, and very high dimensional problems. All of these are very common in science. I'm going to talk about how to incorporate physical knowledge. And this is the really big difference. Because when you work in industry, you are often <coughs> studying something for which we do not know the underlying rules that govern the system. It's complicated. It's often made of people. But in science, we know a lot about the physical world and about physics. And you would not want to ignore that when you set your problem up. So how do you put that into a machine learning context? I'm going to talk a little bit about feature engineering, which is a way, a very simple way, that you can start explaining to the machine learning what you already know so that it doesn't bother learning that. And then a more complicated way when you actually coexist with a sophisticated first principles mo physics model. We're going to then go to the iterative discovery concept of how it's not about training once and for all a single piece of ML and then saying science at the end, but rather training multiple ML models that are slowly revealing things about your data with the purpose of being discovery in that data set, because that's one of the things the scientists need the most. I'm going to give you an example of what I call catalog science, which all science fields are either in or have advanced through at one point or another. It is fairly universal. And then finally, I'm going to give you an example of unethical AI uses, not the typical unethical AI you hear about of, oh, there's a difference in race between a facial recognition system and how it's treating sub, uh, subpopulations, but about how you can accidentally lie to yourself while intending to do good. And because this is based on statistics, it's easier than you think. <coughs> OK. So what's the point of advancing science, physical science with machine learning? Why are they coming to us and saying help? 
And it's all about the fact that we can now acquire data at such an enormous scale and complexity that it is almost impossible to even assimilate it into the existing physical models we have. And what I mean by that is that we have elaborate, beautiful first principles models, say, for the weather. And I will keep going back to the weather example because it's easy to understand. We have satellites that generate terabytes of data a day. You could assimilate all of that. And right now, if you assimilate all of that, the answers will become worse than if you assimilate part of it. So you start saying, what parts do I assimilate? What don't I? The models are breaking down. You can't just take observations, throw them at physics equations, and hope for the best. You have to start understanding what's in that data that's challenging my model. What's wrong with my model that it's not matching the data? And these are not things that physics helps you answer. And this is one of the things that data science can if you set it up right. But the last part that's in yellow is really what I'm going to talk about. Scientists are charged at the end of the day with understanding. That means they have a simplified description of what is governing, what processes were not included in my model and are dominating a particular case in the data. I need that understanding. Simple automation and simple prediction isn't enough. And that's not true in industry, where prediction is pretty much the name of the game. So let's talk briefly about the history of technology and science. And this is just a notional graph. I did not go through all of human history and actually record these bars. But what I wanted to expose to you is that, you know, in the 1600s, a, a researcher, a physical scientist, would spend an enormous amount of time manually taking their data bit by bit. And then they would spend an enormous amount of time writing that down with ink, and then writing down <coughs> the equations to fit, and then doing the math to fit those equations to the data. And at the very end of all that, if they had any time left, they might make some insight. So things were dominated by the process of science more than the action of science discovery. And as we increase the technological uh, era, we increase the ability first to make computation with mechanisms. So we have mechanical calculators. And the time spent actually doing the calculation went down, but more time was spent taking the data to feed those engines. Then electricity came along and not only gave us some simple electric calculators, but the ability to electrically take data, electronic sensors. And this suddenly flooded people with more data than they knew what to do with. And at that time already, there were people saying, what's the point of an electronic sensor? We can't handle all the data, so why take it? That problem was already there at the time. But fortunately, shortly after that, we got computers. And computers were the answer. You put it all on a computer and do what exactly? At this point is when computer science touched science and said, I can help you. And they said, I can start writing simulators that use physics equations to predict what's going to happen. And you can compare that with your observations to make sense of large data sets. And then they said, I can actually do one step better. I can assimilate that data so that what's coming out of these models isn't just physics, but it's physics that has also been negotiated with the observations, say, in a common filter, so that I'm making my best estimate of what the true answer is. This is how we predict the weather today. And this was so successful that this now defines what science is. It redefined itself. Today, when you ask, what do we know about the weather, you can read a bunch of things in a book of equations that govern it, but no one sits down and solves those equations by hand to, to calculate the weather. They go to gigantic million code line programs that take in all the observations, combine them with those equations, and then make predictions. So we codify our understanding of the universe now as code in these models, and we call that progress. That's what it looks like. The problem is, these codes have become so large that you can get a PhD to improve one small module in it. And you don't even know if that was the module that mattered. What's missing? What's next? Where do I look? What's causing the problem is now no longer a trivial question for these codes. And this is one of the places data science can help. So today, we spend an enormous amount of time building models. People make their entire careers out of a small piece of that model. And that's why that green bar is enormous. But it has increased science insight. These models make exceptional predictions. And where they're wrong is the interesting part. That's where all the scientists run. The models disagree over this island at this time. Everyone study the heck out of this moment. There's something to learn here. Why are we getting the wrong answer? It might be numerical. It might be physics. But you can't tell. What data science promises to do is reduce the effort required to make the models. You don't necessarily need an army of graduate students dedicating their lives to make the next best physical model to quickly understand if there's something interesting here or not. Now, that doesn't mean it's science. 
Just making a prediction is part of science. Understanding the processes that control that is the second part. And machine learning actually has trouble doing that. That is not an import statement in a code. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is how to get the insights back out of it. But simply having an extremely fast model that tested a hypothesis and then showed you, yep, you're on the right track, you can predict things, that alone is useful as a hint. You're on the right track, but it's not enough. And that's what the lecture today is about. I'm gonna pause at the end of every slide to see if there's any questions or anything people would like to add. I did not pack this so full that I need to talk to you the entire time. I can, trust me. But if you wanna talk, you wanna ask questions, please, I invite you to do so now. Please. I remember, I remember like reading online that like Google Translate only has like 300 lines of code. So like what kind of models, like if you're discovering the weather or something, well, they're lying, right? It's 300 lines of code that call incredible libraries that are doing amazing things. That is not even remotely possible, that these are simple lines of code. When I quote millions of lines of code, I mean elemental lines, right? Not calling enormous functions that do sophisticated things for you. <coughs> um, however, I do want to emphasize whether prediction isn't what you think. It, is, it was called the quiet revolution a few decades ago, that in the 80s, it was impossible it was numerically impossible to predict the weather for 10 days out. No one on the planet could do it. We do it routinely now. And it was because of advances in assimilative techniques that allowed this transformation. It is a civilization level challenge in which we're assimilating terabytes of data every day from space, from in situ measurements on the ground, and coupled physical models all working together. It's unbelievable what they do. And no one cares because it's just a product now. It's an app. But what, that ha what happens there is so big the United States has one model that they maintain because it takes that much funding. The European Union has one model they maintain and they don't entirely agree. So it is a civilization level challenge. It's truly amazing. And yet they're now up against this barrier I'm describing. That was a great question. Any others? Let's keep going. And by the way, you don't need to raise your hand. Just talk out loud. All right, so let's talk about what industry has done for us, which is tremendous but how it's not quite the same as what we're doing here. So here's some common applications that you've already bumped into in your life, right? Content recognition. Show me pictures of bicycles. That's image data. Alexa, play top hits. That's set recognition within a sound, a time series of uh, amplitudes. This may be melanoma, go see your doctor. That's spectral information, right? I'm seeing some bands that are in a certain ratio that I know puts you in risk. So content recognition is one of the most common applications that industry has really zoomed in on. Your phone has these all over the place now. There's also profile similarity. People like you did things like this, really. This is all recommendation systems. This is, the, the internet is filled with these now. You, you trip over them, trying to get in your way and tell you what you actually want or what you actually mean, or, make billions of dollars by predicting how likely this ad is to be clicked on by you, which is an entire company. Um, anomaly detection. There's 100 hours of security footage, but you only need to look in four places. Everything else was normal. So that's a form of summarization, detecting things that are out of the ordinary and defining norms. Temporal prediction. What is the stock market going to do next? It certainly can't tell you the answer, but it can tell you so much of the answer that it guides you quickly to where you need to bring in maybe your human intuition to do a little more analysis. And this is also epidemic detection in a really unusual way. Let's just watch Twitter and monitor that feed and you can predict epidemics rise and propagation faster than tracking hospital admissions because it predicts it as they go forward. People start saying, I'm sick, this is really bad. I think I need to go to the hospital. They do all of that before they go, so it turns out that it's highly predictive. And you certainly don't know the physics equations to translate English text all the way to epidemic levels. Finally, there's sequence completion. I literally just typed this into Google. I want a green, and then it said, do you mean card, light, bean, what do you want? So it's predicting how do people typically complete this. And, if you, and that's a simple example. Chat GPT is a very complex example where it's trying to predict sentence after sentence after sentence and it just kind of keeps on going. And then we're amazed that it kind of looks realistic. Finally, there's style transfer. And this is the one that's a little weird. I want Mona Lisa, but I, and this is misspelled, but I want it in the style of Van Gogh, right? So there it is. I don't know why you want that, but we have whole systems for doing this nowadays. And this is the whole selfie market. So this is where the industry puts its money because it either does something that's useful so humans don't have to do it anymore, 
or it's fun. And that's the dominant investment in this field, things that are useful or things that are fun. And because of that, we have beautiful libraries available for everyone to use because it's in the company's interest for all of you to get trained in those libraries because they need to hire you to keep this stuff going. So that's why these free libraries are so powerful and why they're out there for your use. And when we look at science applications, at first it looks like a dead win. Let's use this for science. Well, content recognition in the image area, Here's an entire surface of a planet. I want to find impact craters. Here's some examples. That's great. And here's a map that would have required graduate students to weep for years right, as they're slowly circling things. And that is still how it's done in many places. Um, here's a bunch of bird song. Predict how many species are currently in this forest. And then from that, pre predict biodiversity so that we can track it. Same thing as voice recognition. Produce a map of likely hematite composition on Mars. You look at spectral data, you learn how to infer the composition of what you might look at, and now you have a, a map of where water once was on Mars because of the hematite location. So this is looking great. Profile similarity. This earthquake you said was interesting kind of looks like these other events. Go focus your attention there. Anomaly detection. Here's an entire record of GPS data, but there are four seismic events for review that might be of interest. So that looks very promising. Temporal prediction, weather. Everything about weather. Here's what happened before. Here's what's coming next. Here's the drivers you need to know today. So all of those are great matches and really make you feel like it's the same thing. What industry wants is the same thing as what science wants. Now the last two I'm just going to briefly touch on. This is, we're going to get much more in this to the end. When you use this for science, you end up doing something that I call deep fake science data. And it's very dangerous. So fill in any gaps in my data. I routinely see proposals come across my desk for people wanting to do this. And, this. and the disturbing thing is ML says, sure. And it makes a system that can do that. And the answer isn't right, but it looks right because that's what it was trained to do. This is what chat GPT does. If you just assume its response to you is the gap and it's filling it in, that's exactly the problem that it's solving. It's not answering you, it doesn't know what it's saying. It's filling in an empty text box and it's predicting what a human might have said. That's it. Style transfer, this is the weirdest one. Here's some seismic data. What would this have looked like if I had a camera on the surface watching the earthquake happen? People will do this too. And ML will say, here's a very plausible looking surface event and how it would have shaken around. It's completely wrong, but it's extremely believable. So that's the problem. Both of these, when you bring it to science data, produce realistic, but wrong, deep fake science data at the end. And if you hand it to someone now, they can't distinguish between that and reality. So what do you mean by wrong? I think that's like like yes, like it's not the actual footage of the earthquake shaking, but let's say like it's a good representation. Like would that be viewed as wrong? Like, I... So let's take an example of your house from space. I cut your house out and then I say, with the rest of the Earth's data, predict what's here. It will put a house there because there's probably a house. But when you look at it, you say, but that's not my house. But everybody else says, but that was a really realistic looking house. That's what I mean by wrong. And the problem in science is it needs to be right. It doesn't need to look OK. So these systems aren't have, really. Like, I guess, do we have models that are right ever? Like, I mean, even like neurally, right? But this isn't like, like actual reality. This is my representation of like what this exists. So then I will be more precise and say, what you fill in that box has a much higher uncertainty than the rest of the data. Sure. And if you want to be honest sure. and you produce an uncertainty map that goes really big over that, then I have no problem with this at all. Then we have no beef. All right. So I'm going to give you an example of what industry does because it's kind of fun and it also is disturbing. So there's this company out there called Geico and what they really wanted to do for their business model is give you an instant insurance quote. In those days, it took days for them to pour over your data and decide how much they were going to actually charge you for car insurance. So this is how they did it. How do we, how do we get this? And by the way, we don't have access to any information and we want to ask people as little information as possible about themselves. We want to just ask a few key questions and find out who you are. So let's make two assumptions. And here's where you already are feeling the ethics go, wait a minute, what? The first is your past performance predicts future behavior. Now for a human, that's not that scandalous that you should be held responsible for how you behaved. But the second one is, if you know anybody who's risky, then you must be too. Because you have to assume something in order to proceed. So they made that assumption and that's what it's assuming about you. Now, so if you know people's history, and let's just pause there, because you don't <coughs> upload your history, they just know it. They skim it off all available sources online. There's a tremendous amount of information about you. They do this every day. On everything you post and every place you've been and every university you've attended, they map that and make a profile about you. And then you make a connectivity map. Who have you been talking to? 
Who do you know? Who have you lived near? All these things make adjacency maps from which we can now infer trustability from one person to another. Because you have some data of who wasn't trustworthy, so map that just a few places. Then I can now describe every night by inverting that matrix a trustworthy score for every person in the United States in case you click. And that is how the Geico does instant insurance quotes for all of you all the time. There are obvious ethical implications of this. I doubt there's an oversight board ensuring that they are handling all of this well, but it also is very convenient that I can go to Geico and instantly get insured. Um, so I don't want to diminish this. This isn't easy. That's an extraordinarily difficult data science problem. It's a very sparse matrix, and they are interested in custom hardware to be able to avert a matrix that contains a row and column for every person in the entire United States with very sparse data. And that's what they hire people like you to do. Um, it's also worth about $32 billion and is highly ethically encumbered. But this is what the industry looks like. Fortunately, though, because they are desperate for workforce, they make all their libraries free and available so we can leverage them. So why not? I'm not here to say this shouldn't happen. I'm saying it does. So now let's look at, you hear big data. Let's briefly talk about big data because that's not really the issue. You see these exponential curves everywhere, the amount of data that human is generating. And I don't mean that we're actually generating in terms of just making, but that we're capturing and storing, right? We're actively doing that. You make a similar graph for science. It looks kind of the same. So you say, okay, okay, same story in both places. It's not the same data. This is where we start to diverge. On the left, this is intuitive and understandable. When you zoom in and reduce with the data, they are stock market transitions, uh, 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 transactions, or they are entries in a medical file. They are 100% understandable because humans are doing it, and you're a human, so you get it. However, the data collection is approximate and haphazard and sparse. It's horrible. Noise is crazy. All the matrices are sparse. So that's the challenges they struggle with. Science data is completely different. So it's fractally complex. The more you zoom down and try to get at, well, what's really happening, the worse it becomes. You are not going to understand that river delta by zooming in and zooming in and zooming in until you get to the reducible simplicity and then zooming all the way back out. It's too many orders of magnitude scales below you. So there's more in the data than you are ever ready to really fully embrace and understand. The second part is that because it's so complicated, to advance science, we lock down everything else. The data is dense. It is regular. It is carefully calibrated. We understand how we took the data and what the observations are, but interpreting them becomes the challenge because what we're studying is so complicated. This is a fundamentally different problem. And I want you to imagine just for a moment the company out there right now that's using your data to predict if you'll click on an ad. If they use the methods I'll describe to you for science on that, they would be trying to understand why you click on that ad, which essentially is trying to mine out human psychology by watching people click on ads. That's a really complicated problem and absolutely not what they spend their time doing. They just want to make a prediction because that's what they need, decision support. So this is where we start to diverge. So it's not really about big data. It's about complexity. In a mere 50 megabyte data set, you might have spectral um, information, which contains a lot of absorption lines that describe the material that you took this data from. Big data would look at this and go, 50 megabytes, I eat that for lunch, right? This is not anything interesting. But I also didn't take all these different spectra in my data set <coughs> independently. They were taken spatially sampled. They are near each other, and they inform each other. So treating each of them independently is wrong. You have to take into consideration how they're arranged in space. I also had repeat overpasses of that same place. So now I have a time series of spatially correlated spectra. So this is now fundamentally three-dimensional data with multiple e entries in that wavelength direction. This is high-dimensional data, and it's still only 50 megabytes. And then there's the goal. I'm not trying to predict something simple. I'm instead saying, given my current theoretical and empirical understanding, plus the physical models I already have, what, is, what are known and understand pro understood processes that predict what I'm seeing, what's unknown and unrecognized, and what do I know I don't know, and this is what I'm hunting for. I want to break the problem into those three things. Can you help me do this? This is what science looks like. It's not an import statement. At the end of all that, I'm hoping this helped me understand something. And, and can publish a paper on it. So what we're talking about first does have big data because science has the big data problem. Huge data is being taken right now, especially about the Earth. In planetary, it's less. 
but it also has this very complex data. I'm talking about fine scale structure. I'm talking about very high dimensionality. And I'm also talking about spatiotemporal correlations between it that make it complicated so that you have to take that into consideration. I'm also talking about the computation required to execute on this. If you try to use phys protein folding, is simple physics. We know 100% of the physics. There is no new physics to know, but it's un insoluble traditionally because there are so many different scales of time that you would have to model that in order to get one right, the other one would take the lifetime of the universe. So you have to make an approximation to go forward. That is what data science can help with. It's good for that. Finite elements, not so much. Okay. So science can leverage industry's data science tools, but the approach of how you do it is very different. So let's talk about how to incorporate that physics usefully. And before I do that, let's actually pause. Questions, thoughts, things you've seen. Does this make sense? Have you seen data like this? Have you encountered a problem like this where you thought, boy, I'm trying to do a little bit more than predict? How many people are, by the way, in the physical sciences here that you're getting degrees, undergrad or graduate? Fantastic. Please, let's, let's keep together because we're trying to get physical science scientists to pick up some of these tools and learn them, as well as start collaborations between professional data scientists that work with you to help analyze these things too. But the more intuition there is between us, the better these collaborations go. Okay, so how do you bring the physics into your problem? I'm first gonna tell you quick and dirty ways. You are at first gonna go, but that's too simple, but most people don't do it. So let's start there. The first, it's called a model-rich environment. And let's just define what I mean by using machine learning, right? Here's the typical machine learning setup. You have your input data on one side. You have the target that you want to predict. You have some metrics of merit that you've already started learning about. And then you have a really rigorous validation plan. I'm going to keep saying that throughout this entire thing, because if you're not rigorously validating, you might as well go home. You can lie to yourself too easily. And then you imp now you do import and run on your model. It runs for maybe a few hours. And then, ta-da, here's the algorithm that does that for you. You might not know exactly what's in the algorithm, but it is now running, and you can validate it and show that it works. This setup is useful when you don't know any physics. So if you set up a problem like this, I want you to say, I don't know any physics about this problem. I have nothing to add because you didn't. So you're pretending that you don't. And that's very unlikely in the science domain. The second is, if your physical model exists, but it's so slow that it's computationally un impossible, like the protein folding case. It's so implausible to use that I'm going to have to act like I don't know it, even though I do. And then the third is, I'm assuming I have plentiful data, because I'm asking the machine learning to learn everything from scratch. It has never seen this universe before. It doesn't even know there's physics in the world or that humans understand it. It's just trying to map data input to data output. That's a very hard problem. So you're asking it to do everything, so the performance will be lower. So, what if there are physical models floating around already that I have access to? There's no insert physics here onto your machine learning library. What do you do to put that in? Um, and when I say physics mo models, let's talk about what that means. There's the simple ones, finite element first principles simulations, right? Crunch time step to time step to time step and make your predictions. But there's also climatology models. These are where I have models that can predict statistical envelopes on what will happen but I'm not going to tell you mechanically how everything goes forward. You might have access to some of those. There's assimilative models, which use the forward simulation I described, find an element, but fuse it in a common filter-like way with observations. That's even more skilled. And then, likely, there are even multiple and competing models that get slightly different answers, and they were written with different assumptions. That's the most common case. You have a mixture of all these. We don't want the machine learning to learn things we already know, so what can you do? So here's, and then let's go a little bit farther here. Um, the input data in science is also nasty. You've already learned that your input features in, your, in, your, in your, all your problems assume individual, individually distributed, identical. This is never true in science because physics. So if this is weather data, pressure, temperature, humidity, albedo, and rainfall, these are linked <coughs> because there's physics. If they weren't linked, there wouldn't be any physics and there wouldn't be any point to look at them, right? But they also aren't redundant. You cannot predict each of these from the others. There are independent terms in them too. So this is what science data looks like. Highly correlated, not redundant, not 100%. So what do you do? Now, fortunately, it turns out machine learning works just fine without IID. When you go forward, the predictions are still valid. But the difference is the model that you get is not unique anymore. 
there are multiple models that could have chosen different arrangements of the variables to get the same predictions. And while that doesn't sound bad at first, when we try to pull those models apart to, learn, to discover what they learned, that gets hard because those correlations can hide the variables that matter and the variables that don't. So understand that you're working probably in a correlated regime. Feature engineering is the first simplest way to tell the machine learning what you already know about a problem. And I would, challenge to, I would challenge you to say, if you aren't feature engineering, then you are pretending you don't know anything. And that's usually not a good approach. So here's a simple example. A direct machine learning model, let's say we're trying to learn faces. I just take a bunch of faces, I dump it in, I tell it what's a face, what's not a face, and I train the system. Um, and it's trying to learn from scratch what a face is. Very simple and easy to set up. You still will do this because it's a great feasibility test. This will tell you I can model this or not. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how well it can do it because you could have probably helped it out. It also doesn't tell you how it did it. But if instead you take the time to say, I know a lot about faces. They have eyes, they have noses, they have mouths, they have eyebrows. Here's kind of how you find them. I build in some features that help it zoom into those. It is almost unlimited the benefits that you get out of this. First, you've made the learning problem for the machine learning much simpler so that it will probably lock on. And because of that, you need less training data and less validation data to prove that it's working and help it converge. It will actually run faster when you try to train. This is a way to actually speed things up too. But it's much better than that. You can now look through your entire data that you're flowing into it and say, how many eyes are in each of those images? And if the answer isn't a spike at two, you probably want to go look at your data. You have data triage all of a sudden. Some of your input data is corrupted or noisy or messed up, or maybe just other assumptions are wrong about it. You can also start debugging it. When it doesn't perform, you can say, show me the examples that it's not performing well on. Here they are. Well, did the features lock on? Oh, it's having trouble finding eyes. That's where it's having the issue. You can start understanding what goes on. All of this is almost for free. Because to ask you to write these, and I'm not saying each one of these is a sophisticated ML model that looks for eyes across all humanity, just do circle fits. Is there something in there that's kind of circular, that has a dark in the middle and something light on the outside? Really simple statistics can go a huge way because you're incorporating the assumptions you know are valid for the thing you're trying to let it learn. So feature engineering is about teaching simple things and then feeding that into the, as an input to your machine learning. I'm not saying you replace the input data with the features necessarily. Just put them on the side. They shouldn't hurt you in principle, right? They should only be able to help. Sometimes that isn't always true. But in another lecture, when the next time I get to talk with you, we're going to talk about explainability methods where you get to ask the machine learning which of these variables matters most. And now this becomes hypothesis checking. How about I encode a bunch of features that might help and then train the model. And if it works, I can ask it which ones helped you most and get rid of the others. And I've now done hypothesis-based code optimization, algorithm optimization. I've learned more about my problem. And I've learned how the ML is doing what it's doing. All because I was willing to just help it out a little bit at the beginning. So from an engineering point of view, this is irreplaceable. The reason I'm harping on this so much and why it's not obvious is because long ago, and using the machine learning that you know right now, you have to do this. If you want to look at image data or sound data, you have to engineer features. It can't handle the raw data. But deep learning came out. And deep learning can. Its model is sophisticated enough that you can put the raw data in and let it learn. And it learns features for you somewhere in the neural net. You don't know exactly what they are, but they're in there somewhere. That seemed like a huge advance. But then a lot of people lost the art of making feature engineered features. And so now they just take models, throw it at the raw data, and they say, this is the performance, and there's nothing to do about it. There's a lot to do about it. You forgot how to feature engineer. And for science, this is very important. Does it, is that clear on what feature engineering is and why it's useful? Even if you have deep learning, you can still do this. Um, I see how this is useful for face re facial recognition. But uh, what happens if? Because, uh, I, I mean, I assume sometimes when you're doing, when you're trying to predict stuff, you make an assumption of what you think will be important or, like, what will, like, kind of help the model out. And then when you get the result back that you expected, then you think, oh, it did, the, it did something correct. But could it be the case that based on the features that you chose, you basically just told it, like, this is what I want. And then it said, oh, I'll give you what you want. And then you make, like, the assumption that you were right when really you just kind of fed it something... What I love about your question is that you are skeptically inquiring, did I set the problem up wrong to lie to myself? And you should always be asking that. What the answer is, is you get to run as many experiments as you want. Don't encode that feature and see how it does. Encode the feature, does its performance improve? 
Now, you didn't tell it, you better get a better answer. So if the performance improves, you have evidence that you have assisted the learner to get where you want to go. You can also put other rival features in there that you know should not help it, and then show with evidence that they do not. So if you're nervous, make some features that challenge what you're skeptical about and have evidence that it is not that. For instance, tanks happen to always be on cloudy days. Oh God, did I make a cloud detector, not a tank detector? So make a cloud detector and put it in there and show that the cloud detector is skillful in finding clouds and does not correlate with finding tanks and is not chosen in the features that matter. So yes, do that and keep asking those questions. Iterative skepticism is the only way to ensure you learn the right thing. Especially in deep learning when you have giant models, it has the uncanny ability to learn the right thing the wrong way because it's always trying to find the shortest path. So you have to treat it skeptically and not trust your results. It's only when you beat down all the other uh, alternative interpretations you can start feeling confident. That was a great question. Any others about feature engineering? Sure. If you're using a very simple system, I mean, even Lasso is a machine learning system you could use on this problem, and if your features are powerful enough, it'll actually work really well. If it's a deep, big deep learning model, we hypothesize it's locked on eyes. Prove it. How do you know what it's actually using to do a face? It's very difficult. There are methods where you can look at activation maps of where it's focusing on, but when you do those, you discover it has the weirdest answers. I looked in this upper right corner and at their nose, and that's how I determined it's a face. And you're like, well, I guess I can make an argument how that would help you, but I'm not really sure what you're getting at. It's really hard. This makes it explicit. And what's really useful about this is after you go through and make some of these, then you skeptically falsify it again. I actually don't think the eyes are helping. You knock it out, and you show how much the performance drops. And then you look at which faces it's getting right and wrong, and go, oh, that makes sense, because these faces are kind of ambiguous if it doesn't have the eyes. I can see why it's getting confused. Now you have evidence that it is learning the right thing. It is is getting confused and getting things right in accordance with your understanding of all, and that helps. And if you go to the, the logical extreme of this, which is almost never done, but if you can encode beautiful features that capture your problem, your machine learning problem is trivially linear. You can do it with a linear regression. You add up the values of all the features, if it's above this space, it's below this, that, right? And if you do that, you have entirely understood your problem with respect to those feature engineers. Uh, so that from an engineering point of view, from communicating to a scientist, from getting them to use your model, understanding it, this is gold. Because no one's going to say, we don't know how that works. It's very clear. A giant deep learning net might be another story. I think you had a question? So, I, I was just wondering, like, you have raw data and then you have extra features. Doesn't that, like, don't the extra features increase the dimensionality of your Yes. In fact, your features are often not uh, independent. They don't have to be. Right, so they are like kind of adding constraints to your optimization in that, this origin. Do they, uh, uh, do, do they make the optimization more complicated? So increasing the dimensionality of your problem always slightly challenges the learner, but most machine learning methods are useful because they handle high dimensionality fairly well. Some methods don't, and then you should use those on a problem if you have a lot of them. If you're dumping raw data in, you're already in extreme high-dimensional case anyway. So adding a few more is not going to hurt you. However, using your a priori knowledge to extract out some of the knowledge for it and pre-computing it allows it to then focus the rest of its parameters learning the rest of the problem. So the performance will usually go up. Even though you're right, that information was encoded in the original raw data, but it would have had to use more parameters to extract it, and you did it simply for your process. So it usually makes the performance go up. Yeah. So in practice, is your feature detection basically just a really small uh, machine learning problem on top of what? I mean, do you do a small machine learning problem and then plug that in? You're, you're going to the next step already, and I love it. So on a large system that's on board a spacecraft, <coughs> having to make a lot of decisions of what's in the data and what to do about it, 
you can chain different machine learning systems into each other. And then it's kind of almost academic on this is a feature and this is the decider, right? It's a series of these systems all communicating with each other. And maybe they have access to the raw data and maybe they don't. Maybe they're feeding as the input from all the other models. In general, however, that didn't really get you much. Because if you make a machine learning thing that looks for eyes, well, now you want to understand how that's working. So usually these are simple statistics. Usually you want to use something that's very understandable because that advances your understanding as much as possible. But in principle, you could. And that's actually the next thing we're going to do now is say, well, if these can be as complex as I want, but they represent what I already know, why not put the physical models here? And that's the next simple thing. So I just, I'm curious, because you mentioned, let's say I made a, a model that predicts eyes. Like, yes, I would argue, like, you run into the problem of like, how is it predicting eyes, but like, how is that different than like how are we able to tell with an eye? Like, you know, there's like it's some feature extraction that like our brains are doing, for instance. Like, we don't necessarily know everything about that process. Like, at what, at what point? I know that's like I know this like more like an art question maybe, but like, what point do you say like it's okay to just feed in? Oh, this model like predicts eyes at like X percent, and use that as a feature rather than trying to like code that yourself. Or like that. It's always okay to try anything sure. you want. The question is, what are you trying to understand? So if you are completely confident that it's OK that this thing detects eyes, and your question is not how that's happening, no one in the field cares about it, use it as a feature. If you're trying to solve a problem we don't understand yet, putting another mystery box as an input to your system didn't get you very far. Um, and by the way, these usually aren't find an eyes, find a nose, find a mouth, because that's hard. They're how many circular things are on the face? How many th in those circular things, do they have a dark region in the middle and a light region around the outside? And then we just say, these statistics correlate with eyes. That's why this matters. That's good enough. We don't need to get all the way to it has to 100% be correct as an eye or not. And that's why maybe if it finds three in the image, that's OK, but not one. All right, things like that. All right, so what happens now if we say, if the features are a nice way to put in data, let's put the physical models in there. Because we definitely understand what's in those physical models. We wrote them. And that's what it looks like when you start coexisting with models. So here's how scientists are doing things today. They take the observations, they put it into a physical model now, not a machine learned system. It crunches through finite element or whatever it does and it makes predictions coming out. That would be an assimilative system. So what you can do is you can say, well, the output of that physical model is everything I don't want you to learn. I already know that. But you also have access to the observations too, which contain all the physics of the problem because they're just observations. So the ML becomes a corrector. <coughs> Its focus is to learn the bias or the error residual coming out of that model and predicting a better answer at the end. And if that's all you want, this is a quick and dirty way to get a better answer. The machine learning just locks onto that correction signal, and that's that. But what's beautiful about this is if you combine it with feature engineering too, now you start getting to ask the question, what else was in that observation that the physical model was getting wrong? You also aren't limited to use just one model. You can add as many outputs of models as you want here. And then you can ask questions like, which of the models was right when? And this is a sci question scientists have all the time. Because they plot these models across space and time, and then they go, oh, they're disagreeing again. Some places they agree, some places they don't. Why? When? How often? This is hard. It's very difficult to get insight into. And the ML won't answer the question for you, but it gives you a new perspective, a new way to ask that question and get down to it. Um, here's another way to do it. And this is very different than feature engineering now. Maybe you have your physical model making its predictions, but it's agonizingly slow. And one example of this is in weather, propagating the sun's rays coming through the atmosphere, bouncing off the surface of the Earth, and heating everything up, requires an enormous amount of computation, all those grid cells of that radiation propagation. To compute the weather, you probably don't need that much computation. But if you do it with physics, you absolutely do. There's no other way forward. So if you can look in your physics model and you can discover it's this subroutine, it's the propagation of solar rays that's taking 99% of the time, maybe we can take out that correct physics and then we can run it over all the possible parameters you could imagine and train a machine learning model to get the same answer. Oftentimes the answer is yes and it's four to five orders of magnitude faster because it turns out that computing over that grid was sufficient but not necessary. There are shortcuts that you can learn, patterns that you can find, and that's exactly what machine learning is intended to do. So this is emulation for acceleration. And you might say, Luke, you told me acceleration and scaling things up is what industry cares about, not science. The reason you might want to do this is, say, if you care about uncertainty. You don't want to run your weather model once. 
you want to run your weather model 100,000 times and generate a distribution of possible answers and then take statistics on that to see how confident you are. And good luck if you're using the full weather model that takes all that compute. But when you make an approximate model like this, now you can estimate uncertainty on the original model by speeding it up, even if it incurs a little bit of error. So this is an active area of research, very powerful. Here's exactly the opposite way to incorporate physics. And right now, we're getting to the bleeding edge of MML. What I'm telling you right now is not a library you can import. This is go read some papers and let's talk. So instead, let's try to train a machine learning model to make the prediction you care about. But you've already learned about loss functions. And all the machine learning, in the end, is really doing is trying to minimize a loss function over some space of expressivity. Well, include a term of how much it disagrees with your physics in that loss function. So it is doing two things now as an arithmetic sum in a simple idea. It's trying to agree with the observations that you told it and the predictions, and agree with the physics predictions that it said you should get. And you don't have to give it F equals MA over a finite grid. You might just say, and you know what? You just need to conserve energy. That's what I care about. And that constraint might be enough to suddenly bring your answers much closer to reality. The other thing you're doing is you, if it works, lock down your potential space of solutions. So now you need much less training data to converge usefully to let them answer. And this is enormous, because, annotate, because science data is trivial to get access to, but annotated science data is very rare. So you really want to do as much as you can to incorporate what you know to reduce the training that you need. This is called physics-informed machine learning, and this is active research. Now here's the, the full gamut. If you're going to go that far, well, I'm a scientist, and what we really want at the end of the day are new equations, because this is the language of science. I want new terms in my equations that I can interpret, reason about, and understand, and maybe even derive one day. So why not make a machine learning model <coughs> that optimizes in the space of possible operators and terms and derivatives? That's the parameters that it's trying to learn. And let's seed it with the known physics we have now, and let it learn corrected terms that the observations seem to need to explain relating their variables together. Now, this is so exciting that when I first read this, I went, ah, we're finally there. Why didn't we do this to begin with? And the answer is this. In order to validate this model and train it, you had to observe almost everything about the problem. Every term in that equation, you have to have observational data to go in if you want to compute it. And when was the last time you saw a sensor that can tell you everything you could want to know about a cube of any space or any time. It's very rare you can actually take data to substantiate a model like this. But it is an active area of research, and it really is the dream, right? This data is trivial and can be explained with current physics. Thank you. I don't need to look at it anymore. That would be an amazing outcome. Or there's a slight term, it's a third order derivative that if you add here, explains the data 5% better. What the heck is that? What does that mean? That'd be a great way to help science. So this is bleeding edge research, and you usually don't converge, and you usually don't have enough data to do it, but when you do, could be the way forward. And making these stable and useful could be one of the problems that the people in this room actually solve. We need help here, because it's going to transform everything when we link it. Now I'm going to talk to you, and I've already talked with you a little bit, about the concept that it is not never about setting up the right problem, getting an answer, and publishing a paper. It is an iterative process of discovery and learning. This yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an excellent suggestion. That was a lot of ideas. So, thoughts? What are some areas where the last approach is currently tried out? These are hypothetical approaches, and the way that I've seen them mostly being used right now are very simple systems like planetary dynamics. Because those are so locked down and the forces are so understandable that we even know some of the terms that are not currently captured. We have ideas, and we can kind of do sanity checks if it's same. Uh, where they want to use them is in what I would call in situ measurements of 3D fields. So a spacecraft is flying through the solar wind, and we have almost no data whatsoever to lock down an estimation of that whole 3D field, the magnetic field, the electric field, electrons, and multiple ion species flying by. We need physical constraints to say what's reasonable or not. So that's what they would really like to use this. Not so great for facial recognition. Yeah. So 
would be a great sanity check, right? It should come up with agreements on what you know, if you happen to know how those equations relate to the data. So a mature version of this technology, you would want to do exactly that and say, we believe we're locked onto a real signal and my setup of the problem is real because it derived Navier Stokes right out of the box, but then it has these other funky terms and we're interested in that. In practice, it actually needs us to see most of what we know at the beginning to get close enough to actually find the answer because the insufficiency of the data, right? And imagine the data you would have to take to derive Navier Stokes from scratch. No With simulations, you might be able to. I should also say the limitations of this technology are not yet known. There are numerical edges to what you can derive and what you can converge to, and regimes in which you're stable and unstable. And in most of machine learning, these will be known, but are only partially known now. Why machine learning sometimes locks onto things and sometimes doesn't is an active area of applied mathematics right now. And they have made progress, but not finished that. You usually hear things like this. We made an enormous progress by assuming a neural net is infinitely wide and has seven you know, layers deep. And so now we can finally prove one thing about it. You'll see things like that's the stage we're at. So it's really quite early. All right. So the iterative discovery loop, what is that? And there's many different kinds of iteration here. So this is a very general thing to teach you. Um, the traditional approach of how to do science is what I'm going to show you first. And I'm going to call this confirmatory statistics. At no time should you interpret what I'm saying as an insult. This is an excellent way to do science that got us to the moon. It works. I just want to introduce it in a certain way. So you start out with a scientist being exposed to their current <coughs> physics models, some observations they hope contain new things, and then the errors of those models with respect to the observations. It is incumbent on the physicist then, or the scientist studying the system, to come up with a great idea look through the data, find where it disagrees, and wonder what might be causing this. From your brain, right now, there's not a lot of help here. And in fact, science is often derived when they're training uh, young scientists up by saying, just have an idea, please, right? You have to do that, that's your job. So that's a lot of effort and, 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 and uh, stress to put on that person to have a good idea, and good ideas can go really far. But it works because humans are very creative. You then enter into a small iterative loop with your data. You load up MATLAB. You code up your hypothesis, and then you say, if this is true, then on this island at this date, I should see this effect or not. Is that there? Oh, that was a bad idea. And then you have another one, and you have another one. And you keep going until you get an idea that fails falsification repeatedly. You never know if it's right. You just fail to show it's wrong repeatedly. And then you publish it and see if other people can replicate the same thing. So this is pretty good. Um, and at the end of that, hopefully, if everything works great, we have a new term in our equation, a new chapter in a book, a little more physics to know. There's a different way. And this was asked when we started having so much data that scientists said, I'm not even using 99% of my data in that falsification step up there. I am never posing questions that require consistency with all the data everywhere to show it's true. In fact, most science is done by zooming in on these giant data sets to look for clear examples where maybe you have a chance of falsifying or supporting something. So is the, are there other things you can find by looking at all the data together rather than this zooming in? And it's really amazing in the science literature. You will find the same island or the same storm is studied again and again and again and again because the more people that study it, the more clear it becomes for other people to try to use as a learning example too, ignoring all the other storms. So how do we ask questions of the data directly? The new way is to use machine learning and ask a much higher level question rather than is, it, is this the answer? You can say, I wonder if there is a trend that relates to some of these variables that I took in observations over time that is influencing. Or I wonder if there are kinds of data that can group into different areas, and how many are there? I'm, I'm just hypothesizing there's n groups. Don't even know what n is yet, but maybe they cluster together and act similarly. Or maybe if I combine these terms in this interesting way, it is predicted in a useful way. I wonder. So you can ask these high-level questions. You can work with a data scientist, or maybe you already are one if you've learned these. And then you can code this up. And the data scientist helps you by saying, here's how you set up the problem. Here's how we have to condition the variables to feed them in the model. I suggest this model architecture based on the complexity of your problem. But let's try two others just in case to make sure you're one a little more, one a little less. Here's my rigorous validation plan so I don't lie to you or myself. And the scientist then has to sit down and, oddly enough, do exactly the opposite of wondering what's true. They have to go in and tell you what's true on a very small scale. Like, 
care about this, I don't care about this, and take the data endlessly. And they will get frustrated and wonder why is this useful? Why do I have to give you 10,000 annotations? Why aren't five enough? A human would have gotten it by now. Why isn't your system getting it? This is the hard spot. So you're not trading pain, and you're not getting rid of pain, you're just converting it to be annotating carefully in your data to explain what the machine learning should do. But if you do all that, then machine learning will do what it did. It will find an algorithm for you that does what you explained for it. And this algorithm will not be useful. It will immediately fail. But it will be interesting how it fails. It got the right answer here, but not here. Oh, I need to get more examples like this. So you go back and you fix your annotations. And then you retrain the model. OK, now it's failing here, but not here. But it is doing even better. If you keep doing this and purifying again and again and again, you make progress until your model's skill goes higher and higher and higher until its predictions become interesting that it's able to do that. Nobody else can make these predictions. How is it doing that? And if you ask that question of the model and you can figure out how it's doing that, you have now created a hypothesis that is consistent with all your data that didn't necessarily come from you. It came from you indirectly by asking a high-level question and annotations. But all of a sudden you say, you know, how it's working is it's using these three variables. And I don't actually understand why these three variables should help. There's something interesting here that shouldn't be true. That's the most exciting moment. Because now they can go back and think all the thoughts they want and keep creating just like they were. They have some ideas that came from the data to help out. So this is one of the ways that you can iterate. And at the end of this, you throw your model away. You didn't train the model to give to anybody else or do anything with other than to inspire you to ask the question you exist with the data. That's pretty exciting. However, sometimes, you happen to have a model at the end that's useful, so you give that out to the community and say, I, have, I now have a strangely high fidelity creator detector that I happen to use as a purpose, but you can use it too in case it helps your science. This is all industry cares about. It's this. This is mostly what science is. It's trying to get the out of it. So that's one way to use these systems, and that's one of the reasons why using simple methods is useful. But that step is easier if you use a simple model. It's very hard if you use an enormous complex one. So let's just pause there for a moment. Is that clear on how you might want to use these things and why it doesn't actually matter what your model is or the final answer and accuracy where it gets? You're using it as a discovery tool. All right. Now we're going to advance a little bit here. I've shown you a few things. That's not all there is to say on those topics. But I want to, and I'm watching the time. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about different science domains and what they need. Because machine learning looks very different when you try to do what I just described to you in different areas. So let's just take three examples for a moment. The Earth's atmosphere, the surface of Mars, maybe GPS time series. And one place that uh, all science starts in a continuum record. I'm just taking observations. I have a stream of them. Don't know what anything means yet, but I'm recording it. I'm recording it systematically. Right? We have huge records of that. All science has been there. The next step is to say, what are discrete events? What are things I can understand? What are storms and clouds and rain and precipitation? There is droughts, right? I can start chunking things together. I call this the stamp collecting phase, right? I want to find all the kinds of things there are and then describe and the examples of those kinds of things all around. They might be all the surface features on the surface of the planet, all the weather events and subunits of that, all the time series inside GPS, exactly what can the Earth do, how does it move, what does it look like? After that catalog phase, we then start building theoretical models that try to explain each of the events. For this event, and it's only this kind of event, this slow earthquake, whatever you're studying, here's my model of how it goes, and let's compare it to the data. You start pulling out understanding. And after that, you start taking all these models and putting them together. Well, I have good models for all the individual events and pretty much everything that happens, but do they integrate together? Does it make the coherent story? Does global patterns, trends, and yearly behavior now make sense? Is the energy budget matching? And then if you're really good at that, Weather is about the only place we've gone past this on. You start making this concept called a digital twin. And a digital twin means we have parameterized the Earth to the point that we have a digital model that is assimilating data from all around the world in an incredible fidelity. And it is our current best estimate of the state of that system and everything you might want to know about. So if you want to measure something on the Earth, you might be able to make a measurement on the digital twin instead of on the Earth because it's lockstep with it. And places where your digital twin is disagreeing with some of the incoming sensory data is where you should go as a scientist to study why. There's something interesting there we haven't captured yet in some way. So we really only have, to, we're starting to do this for weather now. We're just transitioning to this state. You see this in Hollywood all the time. And for every engineered system, they have a digital twin and they mess with it. 
But the other thing that digital twins are good for is that if you believe in them, if they have earned your trust over time by faithfully reproducing data, you can do experiments on them you can't do on the Earth. What happens if we increase the sun's path by a factor of two? What happens if we increase CO2 levels? Things like that. But what I want you to remember is that if machine learning is anywhere in that system at all, and especially if you don't have physics guiding you, all machine learning is an interpolative method. It interpolates between the data that it's been seen in a very complex space, not in a simple way, but it does not extrapolate, ever. There are no guarantees that if you show a machine learning system something it's never seen before, or a parameter range it has no data for, that it will do the right thing. Zero guarantees. It looks inward. So you want to be very careful when you use things like digital twins and then predict the climate in a regime where we have no training data, say, because who knows if that's right or wrong. It's not actually that scandalous, because how would you validate it anyway? You're putting it into a system you have no validation data for. So why would it be right? Physics can. That's why we really like physics models. All right. So how does data science look in these different uh, categorizations? And I'll just skip through this in the interest of time. But at the very beginning of the continuum record, there's just endless need for data-driven discovery. What's in the giant record? What are the individual events and units anyway? Can I use clustering or something just to give me an idea what I'm looking at and help me find meaningful groups and distinctions. Event detection and helping in situ event capture. There's an event that happened here and I can zoom in and I can study the heck out of it, but I needed help finding it. When you get to the catalog area, it's now, the data-driven discovery still stays there, but now it's about annotating what I currently know so that I can look for things that I don't. And having a repeated discussion with your data, annotating it more and more, changing your annotations, changing your mind, splitting groups into two so that you are slowly but surely encoding your knowledge a larger and larger annotation set over that record and breaking it up into more and more understandable chunks of meaning so that then you can pair them off to individual grad students and say, that's your dissertation, that's your dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then purification. Whenever you're annotating, you're doing it wrong. I promise you. Because it's a very hard problem and humans make mistakes. So any discovery that you're ever doing in your data is first and foremost finding the errors in your annotation. Embrace that and you will live a happy life. Forget that. Finally, knowledge capture. Annotations are not just for training machine learning. They are a way to communicate with other humans. You can check them in the GitHub. You can share them in the community. They can make their own annotations, and you can argue viciously on why you disagree. And that actually is advancing knowledge. So this is a systematic way of codifying science understanding at this level. In theoretical models, you start being able to say, here's what the observations did. Here's what my model said. Here's the variables that might predict why they disagree, which ones matter and use that to improve your physical model. So it becomes a discovery tool to discover what's wrong in your model and how to make it better. And today, this is where science is really hitting a bottleneck because the traditional methods of advancing those models are hitting a wall. They need help to explore the data in a collaborative sense. And then also, if you get good at it, with feature engineering and others, you can hypothesis check. I think this is true. Go see if that's consistent with all my data for me. And you can set up the problem trivial easily in order to do that. For global models, now it's all about, are they right or are they wrong? Where are they wrong? Can we characterize why they're wrong? Which variables are right and when they're wrong? It becomes that kind of a question because we're getting more mature. It's about explanatory completeness, and then all of a sudden this comes in. These models are so big that we can no longer compute them. It's too expensive or it takes too long. Can we accelerate them? So suddenly emulators come into it. And it's harmonization. I have 15 overlapping data sets that are all measuring the same place on the Earth at the same time. How do I usefully bring all this data together? <coughs> and at the very end, this becomes formalized as uncertainty quantification. This is the idea that I'm no longer trying to predict. That's not good enough. I have to also estimate how confident I am in my prediction. In science, it's been said, if you don't quantify your uncertainty, then your prediction has no value. Because you know, people need to understand how confident you are. That, I take issue with that statement because actually in the early stages of any science area, it's quite useful to make predictions. Even if you don't know how certain you are, you still learn a lot. But in the end, if you really want to demonstrate mastery, you have to be able to talk about uncertainty and quantify the ranges. And machine learning doesn't do that for you. There's no library you can call that is ml.uncertainty, which is not accurate. <laughs> Instead, it's an ensemble, and it's Bayesian statistics, and it's all those things, again, it never goes away. But if you enable those, probably need emulators and everything else the machine learning was helping. So let's pause there for a moment. Is that clear how, how machine learning helps science evolves as the science evolves? Yeah. 
every different science domain is in a different place here. Planetary science is all the way over here. We have hardly any data. The Earth we live on is over there because we live here. It's pretty easy to take data. Okay, let's keep going. Because I see now that I was overly ambitious instead of under, which is great because that means we're having a good discussion. Um, I want to give you a very brief catalog example. I want, I want to go back to, I don't know if you can, where's my cursor? Well, I'm going to go to the catalog example. So in this case, we are having a continuous record, and we're trying to break it down into discrete events to advance our understanding in a collaborative way that informs the community and works with everybody. Let's just zoom in on that for a moment. So this is all about assembling your initial objects and events. Um, and here's some examples of what I mean by that. You know, impact, fresh impacts on Mars, not just impacts, but the ones that occurred recently look funny, so you can find them and recognize them, and there's lots of scientists interested in that because they probe the subsurface. Could you please go find those for me? And uh, partic particular spatial reasons of change. This is huge on the Earth. What's changing on the Earth? How fast is it changing? Where is that going? Do we understand the processes that are explaining that change, especially humans versus not? Uh, unusual outliers, you don't really want it thinking that the InSight lander is a normal surface feature on Mars. So it's a great way to test anomaly detection because it better show all the human intrusion on there or you're not really working very well. Um, least sequential predictable events. This is great for earthquake detection. I learn all the trends and seasonal behaviors and rise and fall of the Earth because the water is flowing into the ground and then sudden, su suddenly something happens that was fundamentally not predictable. That's interesting. Let's make a catalog of those. Um, different kinds of terrain. These are texturally different than everything around them, and that means their geologic interpretation is also different. And what geologists really love is the contact points between them. So if you can automatically classify on a surface, there are 17 kinds of terrain. Here's typical examples of each, and here's the contact points between them. You've actually helped a geologist a lot of knowing where to focus their attention. And then, of course, storms are very clear on how those events are out there. Um, so let's go on how this goes. And this is, this is a narrative now. I'm describing this with you and walk with me for a minute. Let's say you have decided to get a dissertation in this area. You're working with physical scientists. You're the data scientist. You're trying to help them out. You start with a few cataloged examples, like I just said up there. A few things that you know are helping you make progress. You look in this enormous, vast, uncataloged source data that's pouring in daily, and you say, how can I help? So the first thing you do is you say, what's most similar to these? I want more like this and the machine learning helps you. And at first it's horrible, but you keep retraining your annotations until it gets better and better and better, and you have some single-use models that are helping you focus in on things of interest. You can also ask the opposite. What is least similar to these? What things have the least score of the things I know about? And this is now focus of attention on things you didn't ask about or didn't focus. They might show you noise, but now you know there's noise in your data. Did you know that some of the images were all noise? There's always something to learn. You also can say what's most confusing, what has the least confidence in my prediction. Not the highest and lowest score, but I just am baffled. I don't know what this is. That can be a great way to discover new things that you don't currently understand. After you do this for a while, you have built up a whole bunch of stuff for you to analyze, think about, maybe annotate. And so the next step that you do is say, what are the emergent groups that I see here? How would I like to segregate this out in a meaningful way? You can also say, what are outliers? Without me telling you what I know, what stands out? And you could subtract out all the examples you currently understand and say, now what stands out? And you can keep doing this and find the weird ones. This is, for instance, one of the ways that we found the most hematite-rich rock on the surface of Mars was by looking for outliers and discovered one that was ridiculously rich. And that had very important scientific meaning. Um, you can also find subclasses. I thought this was a class, but you know, it keeps getting confused. It's actually two classes. I did a bad job. So you go back and you reannotate, and now you learn something and you go <coughs> forward. You now can also compare with theoretical models. Which of these are explained by current physics and which of these are totally baffling? That's another annotation that you can add to each of these events now. You can ask how well or poorly are they modeled by physics, and that becomes a kind of annotation for you to go dis make more discoveries. And you are always doing quality control and purifying, no matter how hard you try. So the end of your project, you'll be doing that. And on your final slide, you'll talk about what errors you suspect are still in there, because it's just what happens. Then you characterize and you capture. You can ask the machine learning to generate simple explanations between the groups that you've identified to help you get ideas on what might the physics that might be driving the differences between the things you're looking at. And finally, you publish all of that and make it a community record. And you should always look at your problem as though that's what you're doing. 
the data set that you're preparing, the annotations that you're painstakingly making and remaking and remaking, all need to be published so someone else can take them and keep going. And eventually it will get big enough that it will become a website and someone will pay for it. And all the scientists will be logging into it and contributing to it and then it will be called JMARS or some of these other things, which is exactly what happened. And someone will write a custom web viewer for you that puts on layers for all the different annotations people have done so far. And that is becoming what science is starting to look like now. Community-based science, because the problems we're solving aren't really easy for one person to do. All right, there's a few other topics before we leave today, and we'll go through them rather quickly. Data fusion and decision support. One of the things that machine learning is really useful for is that you don't have to know physics in order for it to work. You can simply dump data in, and then you can say, can you make the prediction? In science, you wouldn't think that this would be particularly important, but it's actually really important because we want to do science applications, not just science prediction and science advancement, but we want to say, does climate science inform us on whether we should build a dam? And to get information on that, you need to start bringing in socioeconomic information, a bunch of other information for which there are no terms in your physics equations. So we want to be able to fuse data and ask, did this help? Is it useful? Is it informative? And that is exactly what explainability methods are for, which we'll talk about the next time I get to chat with you. You can propose a bunch of information that might have been useful, and then it says, these are not, this one was, and here's the percentage that it helped by. And now you know where some of the information lay, and you can maybe start reasoning about it if you want to understand it, but you can also help decision makers make decisions that are related to science understanding as well. This is how people track pandemics through phone use and things like that. They do not write equations with terms. The last thing I want to leave you with today is, whoops, is what, where do we go? Is what not to do. I am going to show you a gun, and I'm going to ask you to not pick it up but I want you to know what a gun looks like because when you don't, you pick it up. So, <laughs> the reason this is what it is is because statistics are trivial to lie with, most importantly to yourself. If you do not validate and cross-validate and then challenge your validation strategy and disbelieve it and skeptically show it and then ask someone else how they would challenge it, you probably lied to yourself. It's that easy. And here's what it looks like. I want to show you the right way first. You take in gappy data, your sensor is turning off and on, your spacecraft is rotating so you're not measuring things all the time, whatever, however this happened, and you have the idea, could we use physics and observations and statistics to fill in those gaps and make a continuous record? Because none of the downstream algorithms that take in this data can handle gappy data. They just seg fault. They can't handle it. And the gappy data is obviously wrong, so this must be better. And if these informative co-observations are talking about what's in that gap, if they're giving you information that might not be what you wanted, but it's related to it, this is a totally valid thing to do. I don't know what was there, but I have the shadow of what was there, so I can predict what was there. That's OK. And if you cross-validate, you're all right. Another example. I take low-resolution observations from one satellite that's everywhere, and I learn to predict very high-resolution data that's only <coughs> some places. So now I have high-resolution data everywhere. This works. And as long as you have other high resolution data that's telling you something about where you didn't have high resolution data but it's related to it, this is a valid problem again. And if you cross validate and really challenge yourself, it's okay. But here's the terrible thing. If you turn those boxes off, your system still works. And your answers look great. When you examine them, people will be disbelieving how beautiful it is if you choose the right algorithm and you have enough data takes a lot of compute too. But it is plausible, not right. And then people get excited and they give these to other data, to other scientists. And then those scientists run and get conclusions on them and start learning about them and making power laws based on the relationships on these. And all of these products are deriving from what you gave them are wrong, but plausible. They're also not completely wrong. If they were completely wrong, people would be like, this is ridiculous, I disbelieve it. They're not. Humans use sniff tests, sanity checks, and quick exam examinations to see if something seems right, because usually that tells you if something's wrong. Machine learning systems shortcut that and say, I'm going to give you something that looks reasonable very quickly that you can't, as a human, necessarily detect. So there are two ways to protect yourself from this outcome. The first 
is with rigorous cross validation. If you really do test train splits, you split them up and you sort your data all around and you honestly ask how correct were you when you filled in this data, you'll discover really quickly that it's doing a reasonable job but not a right job and you'll be able to estimate it. It also won't be completely wrong, it'll be somewhere in the middle. The second way to do this is to really zoom in and study it in great detail and then produce uncertainty maps. If you produce an uncertainty map that says exactly how much you can be confident that this is right and wrong and that's increasing and decreasing depending on what you filled in, you're being completely honest. That is completely legitimate and you'll be horrified at how big that uncertainty gets when it has to fill in big regions and things like that. But that is the honest answer. You hand your product to a scientist and an uncertainty map and say, don't ignore this. Don't pretend like I'm certain and that will protect you. Okay, so that's where we're gonna close for today with the idea that sometimes, in a coloration example, it's that that would have advanced science. Your generative model will never make this. It will make a very realistic looking human and you will miss the science discovery and tell people that that doesn't exist because it wasn't in your training data. That's a big problem. Summarizes everything that we've learned today, but it's really the bottom line I want you to take away with. Machine learning is as powerful as your validation method. If you take out one test set at the end and then test yourself on that, so that's my generalization error, good luck with that. I'm sure you did a perfect job selecting that test set as being exactly representative of everything in your entire problem, because that's what you're saying it is. Be careful. But if you are, this is a great way to make discoveries. And that's what I love to do with our research. Our group does this a lot, and they handle scientists. Not automating things, but trying to help them find things and boil it down to understand. Thanks. <laughs>